right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by James Turk, who is actually over in the UK in London. How are you doing, James? Very good. Good. Great to be with you, John. Yeah, and uh, James is the founder and lead director of Gold Money Inc., a gold-based financial services company listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange that administers for its clients 1.8 billion of precious metals. And James, you've specialized in international banking, finance, and investments since the beginning of your career back in the six, late 60s with Chase Manhattan, now JP Morgan and later managed commodity department in Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. And what we're going to talk about today is largely we're going to talk about your new book, which is Money and Liberty, which is being published in December. So golden money is the topic. What a great topic to start the day with golden money. Um, so, James, um, first of all, just give me a little bit of uh, background on the genesis of the book and, and why you why you wrote it. Well, gold has been a very important part of my life um, uh, from even from childhood, um, understanding sound money. I'm a first generation American uh, whose parents left uh, Austria um, during uh, after the First World War during, you know, because of the Austrian hyperinflation. So it, I've learned from childhood you know, the importance of having sound money. But later on in the 1970s, I've learned something also very important that sound money and liberty are linked. And this was from a speech that I read from Howard Buffett, who happened to be the father of Warren Buffett. It was a speech that he gave in 1948. And he described how in order to have liberty, you have to have politically honest money and gold is politically honest money. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's fascinating. So uh, just explain to me when you say politically honest money, uh, gold, explain that. Yeah. In order to understand that, you have to look at purchasing power. Purchasing power is the financial means to buy, sell, and invest. Uh, in other words, we work to earn purchasing power, uh, and money conveys that purchasing power. Now, currency is different than money. Currency can be created out of thin air by central banks, and that puts people who earn purchasing power at a disadvantage. So, for example, over the past several years, the Federal Reserve has been pumping up the quantity of dollar currency uh, much faster than real money, politically honest money, gold is, has been growing. As a consequence, you have inflation. Um, in other words, look at it this way. You know, several years ago, Ben Bernanke, when he was chairman of the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. said he could drop dollar bills from hel helicopters to increase the quantity of dollar currency. But why would you do that? Because you're not increasing goods and services, which is what the real wealth of a nation is. All you're doing is making those goods and services more expensive because you're increasing the quantity of currency available to purchase those goods and services. So politically honest money is money that comes from hard work, it doesn't come from helicopters or the printing press of the Federal Reserve. Yeah, well, if he is, if, if anybody is going to fly a helicopter and dump money out of it, I can give you my address right now. <laughs> just dump it in my backyard. Well, they're not um, dropping money out of there. They're dropping currency out of there. And there's a big yeah, difference between money. Yeah, and you're currency. right. You're right. Absolutely. Um, and I guess, I guess that's what it, it, people today get, get very confused, uh, you know, because obviously inflation is a big topic right now. But I think people get very confused about, as you said, just like I did right there, um, um, money versus currency. And and they hear about gold all the time. But I think for a lot of people, they, they just feel like gold is something specialized that maybe I can't get into or I shouldn't be considering because I don't really know enough about it. And I think people have a reluctance sometimes to move beyond what are nowadays considered the traditional places to invest? Well, gold is not an investment. And let me give you an example of that. It, it, first of all, it's money. It's not an investment. They're two fundamentally different things. You know, if you have a portfolio, you have your investments and you have your cash. Gold goes in the cash component of your portfolio, your liquidity. And the reason why it's not an investment, and the example I like to use, is that an ounce of gold today buys the same amount of crude oil it did 70 years ago. So it didn't increase your purchasing power. It just maintained your purchasing power over seven decades, which is one of the functions of what money is supposed to do. And gold does it very, very well. So don't be misled by thinking that gold is an investment. It's not. It's money. And it goes in the money part, the liquidity part of your portfolio. And the beauty of it is that because it's a tangible asset, 
there's no counterparty risk. It's money that you own, not money that's owed to you by some bank or some government. It, there's a fundamental difference there too, which becomes particularly important when we have a financial crisis. And there've been many of those even in my lifetime, but throughout history. Uh, 2008 was the last financial crisis and counterparty risk became a concern. You know, was the bank that you had your currency deposited, was that safe? Um, there will be another financial crisis because the recurring events because of the nature of the, of the banking system itself. And one of the best ways to prepare for the uncertain future is to own physical assets like gold and silver too, I should add. I remember as a, as a child growing up in the 1950s, my parents would go into the local gas station, fill up the family car with two silver dollars. Today, two dollars doesn't even buy a gallon. But if you take the content, the value of the silver in those two silver dollars, you can still fill up the family car. Wow, wow, that's that, that, that's incredible. But like I said, I think people, um, and again, I mean, a great great thing that you pointed out there about the very the difference between between an investment uh, and and what gold is, because I think a lot of people don't you know don't really understand that, and uh, and like I said, I think reluctant to get into it. But I think what you're saying now is if you want to somewhat at least have a uh, a hedge against uh, financial incidents, which you're correct, they're going to happen. And I think probably going to happen more often that you should be looking at physical assets. Gold and silver, houses, timberland, um, mines, you know, things that are tangible as opposed to things that are owed to you. Um, avoid things that are denominated in a currency like bonds, insurance policies, bank accounts, bank deposit, things of that, that nature. Own things rather than promises. Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, you know, the, the culture that we kind of live in, I mean, people like the promise because the promises tend to be a lot more kind of wild than the than maybe what looks like a bit more staid and traditional. Yeah, that happens in the financial uh, mania. And I think, you know, given what we're seeing today in the various markets around the world, not just the United States, but globally, I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of financial mania going on. And the sad thing about this, John, is that if you read the constitution, what the framers put into there were sound monetary provisions because they had just gone through the collapse of the country's first currency, which was the continental. So what they did is they said that the federal government can coin money, not to print money, there's no authority to do that, or to grant an exclusive privilege to a central bank like the Federal Reserve to print money. It can coin money and regulate the value thereof, which meant that it could fix the gold silver ratio so that there was always sufficient metal on hand to make sure that the coinage could be produced because you always wanted to have both a mix of gold and silver coin under a bimetallist system. So we've ignored the provisions of the constitution and it looks like we're going through the same problem that the, fa the framers went through with an unstable volatile currency that could end up very well collapsing if the Federal Reserve doesn't re go back to sound money policies if the federal government itself doesn't go back to sound money policies. Yeah, and what would some of those sound money policies be from, from your point of view? Basically, we'll focus on earned purchasing power, not create phantom purchasing power out of thin air with bank accounting or the printing press. That's essentially what it is. And that's what the framers had in mind when they said the federal government can coin money and did not give the federal government any other monetary powers. In fact, it said the states cannot accept anything except gold and silver coin. Uh, just re-emphasizing how important politically honest money is. And this goes back to that speech that I read from Howard Buffett. If you have liberty, uh, you have politically honest money. And if you don't have liberty, you have tyranny. And you can have tyranny because governments can use the power to create currency out of thin air to their advantage, to the disadvantage of every working American who goes out and struggles to generate purchasing power from hard work, rather than the printing press or bank accounting creating currency out of thin air. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it seems that this has become the pervasive way that the whole world works and the, the you know, the financial systems, you know, per, you know, cross national and international. And uh, are there, are there any, and there any countries you see today that you would point to and say they have a fiscally sound policy? Fortunately, no. Uh, you know, before the creation of the euro, uh, Germany had a fairly sound policy uh, because of the way the Bundesbank was created. It was made totally independent from the um, German government and was done purposefully because the allies realized that in order to create a, uh, 
the, the spending power during a war, governments create currency out of thin air to finance that war. And having just fought two world wars against Germany, they wanted to make sure there wouldn't be a third. So they instilled in the Buddhist bank law, the importance of the independence. And all of the managers, managers of the Bundesbank up to the early 1990s had in their living memory, the collapse of the Reichsmark after the second world war. So they very dutifully followed sound monetary principles very well. And the Deutschmark was considered a sound currency, but that's disappeared with the Euro. Yeah, and, and it, it's fun, it's fascinating what you just said there about people, you know, in living memory of, of real financial collapse or, and I guess, you know, as you come back to the States today, you know, there, there maybe isn't that kind of memory of, of severe financial crisis. Yeah, we went through the financial crisis and all of that. But somehow there always there seems to be the way things are set up that you can almost leverage your way out of problems right now and kick the can down the road. Yeah, unfortunately, the can can only get kicked so far. It's going to come up with you. And that's what these recurring banking crises are all about because it comes down to a reconciliation of real things versus promises. And banks oftentimes will, during a crunch and during a crisis, and governments too, those promises will get broken. The level of debt is just too great to be uh, all of those promises to be met. It's just a question of when that reconciliation or reckoning uh, finally hits. Uh, we've managed to keep the ball in the air much longer than I expected possible, but eventually it will come crashing down and we go back to a sound monetary system, hopefully. We can go the right way or we can go the wrong way. You know, we went the right way after the collapse of the Continental and the framers created the constitution and put in those monetary provisions. Germany, after the, um, the collapse of their currency in the 1920s, went the wrong way, led to, you know, problems of uh, Nazism and the Second World War. Um, and let's hope that we don't go the wrong way and, in fact, go the right way back to the wisdom of the framers of the Constitution. Yeah. So do you, um, so do you see us going the, the right path? Do you ever see us going back to something that's more, I mean, even back to the gold standard someday? But I mean, do you see us going, do you really see us going in that direction? Or do you think the, the people who are obviously enjoying um, the way the, the financial system is set up right now and benefiting from it would, would resist? Well, there is going to be resistance, but ultimately the market wins. Uh, either the government destroys the market and takes away all of our freedom like Venezuela or the market wins and the government goes back to gold uh, in one of two ways. The market will force it back to gold or they will do it voluntarily. We did that after the war between the North and the South. The government had abandoned the, uh, the gold uh, or at that time silver standard and um, created greenbacks, just paper currency to finance the war. Um, after that, they decided to go back to uh, the standard and they set up a plan for 10 years to enable redemption of the paper currency back into physical metal. And they did it and it worked. We could do that again by saying that in 10 years, we're gonna go back to a sound monetary system, a constitutional one in accordance with the provisions of the constitution, or eventually that they'll be forced to go back by market forces. Hopefully we won't go the way of Venezuela where governments destroy markets long before they ever understand how they work. Yeah. So what would that look like if we went back to, if we went back to gold standards, um, what would that look like from, how would people see the, react, the results of that? I don't think we'll be using gold coins. I think the gold will circulate digitally, um, much like currency now circulates digitally. You know, currency has a history to it. Uh, it evolves because of technological improvements. You know, it started with very rudimentary coins and then somebody decided to put milling around the edge to prevent you know, clipping of coins and um, making artificial coins or counterfeiting coins. Then paper currency was developed, then bank deposits were developed, then plastic cards, and eventually, you know, cryptocurrency and digital currency. So currency evolves, but money is the same thing. Money is gold. It stays the same throughout history. It preserves purchasing power over long periods of time. So I think what we're going to do is go back to money, uh, gold, but it will circulate digitally, uh, or perhaps even with some way with cryptos. Um, it's up for the market to determine how that will work. And that's why all of these new developments that we're seeing in the payments industry Governments should get away from that and allow the entrepreneurs and the innovators to develop all these new techniques. And the ones that are best, the market will choose it and they will, that will be a successful payment system. 
but let the market choose. The government should not stop all of these innovators from developing new systems. Yeah, and, and you can see that today, obviously, with, uh, with, with the cryptocurrencies, uh, like the government seemed to be, to say the least, I think a little confused and really unsure how to react to, to cryptocurrency. They see it as a threat to their privilege of creating purchasing power, phantom purchasing power out of thin air. Um, that's why I think they're fighting it. But, you know, just like the Luddites lost their babble in Britain uh, hundreds mm -hmm. of years ago, uh, you can't stop the forces of technology. Technology is important because it improves our standard of living over time. Uh, look at the way we live today versus the way you know, people lived 50, 100 years ago. And imagine if we allow technology to continue to develop how we will be living in 50 or 100 years from now. So governments have to get out of this resistance to new payment systems because the more efficient the payment system is, the more secure and safe it is, there's more opportunities for commerce. And that's good because opportunities for commerce cause us to raise our standards of living. We create wealth in that way. And today with modern communication being what it is, we can do commerce globally, but we need to have a good sound payment system to enable that to happen. Yeah, and the other thing I was just gonna ask you is, okay, do you think, do you think there will be an enlightenment or an awakening of moving towards, um, you know, solid or sound fiscal policy, or is it going to is it going to take a crisis to force us that way? Because, I mean, if you look at politicians come and go, the the government is somewhat fluid, etc., and we we're very much short term thinking right now. Unfortunately, I think that's a cultural thing pervading all of culture, not just what we're talking about where people don't look beyond the end of their own noses and everything is immediate and they're not really worried about the future. So do you think, are there forces at work that can help us move in the right direction without having to rely on a crisis or is it just gonna take a crisis to force new thinking? I think it probably will take a crisis, but let's hope it's peaceful. Uh, that's my major concern. You know, we cannot predict the future, it's unknowable. But we do know that if you're on a road and you're heading in the wrong direction and you're heading toward a cliff, sooner or later, you're gonna go over that cliff. That's not a prediction. The prediction comes if you try to put some timing element to it. Uh, but we can't predict the timing, but we do know we're heading in the wrong direction. We have to go back to the basic monetary provisions installed by the uh, framers, but pretty much forgotten throughout the 20th century as governments and central banks have taken over the monetary system and as a consequence of eroded individual liberty. So if we want liberty, we have to have politically honest money is what it all comes down to. Let's hope it all happens peacefully. Yeah. So is, is, there, is there any kind of like movement around this? Are there people that you would say are, are, are pushing this now? Are there people in, say, in the present, uh, uh, you know, politicians in Washington or even London or whatever, people who, who actually understand this and are trying to, to move the ball forward? Yes, there is. And a lot of this is available through the internet. You know, the internet, like the mainstream media, there's a lot of good stuff and a lot of rubbish. So you have to sort through the rubbish in order to get to the good stuff. But yes, you know, there are, there are things that are out there. Uh, there's a lot of educational material. Um, I'm not the only one who's talking about politically honest money. There are a lot of videos on the internet. Uh, if people want to learn more about uh, gold and silver and monetary history, uh, they just have to do a little bit of research uh, and they can see these videos and reports and various things and start reading and educating themselves because another part of achieving liberty is to have a well-educated polity yeah no absolutely and and obviously uh, like i said i mean people get bombarded today with every kind of investment thing and then looking at you know as you pointed out earlier you know a lot of people look at gold as an investment when they shouldn't uh, um, so I think the education piece is, is critical. And I guess that you can get away with this kind of financial or fiscal policy if you don't have, if perhaps you have a, a less enlightened um, populace and we don't educate ourselves. Yeah, we need to educate ourselves. And what it all comes down to at the end of the day, John, is that we have to, the future is uncertain. We don't know how it's going to unfold, but we have to do what we think best in order to sleep well at night. That's what we all want to do. Um, and history has shown over 5,000 years that one of the best ways to prepare for an uncertain future is to own some physical gold, physical silver, uh, and focus on you know, tangible assets during a period of uncertainty, particularly with inflation 
raging and likely to grow uh, further in the year ahead. Yeah, no, absolutely. Listen, this has been fantastic, uh, James. So the book is uh, Money and Liberty. All of James's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about the book and about what you do. Yeah, um, well, I've been involved in the gold industry throughout my entire business career, which now goes back to the, you know, the late 1960s. And uh, I'm still the lead director. I'm the founder and lead director of Gold Money. Uh, no longer involved in the day-to-day, -day, but I am on the board of directors. And what I'm focusing now in my semi-retirement is just providing more information uh, about liberty and its inextricable link to sound money. Uh, you know, I want my, my grandchildren uh, to live uh, with, in a world with liberty. And in my lifetime, I've seen how liberty is eroding. And that for me is very, very scary. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I would encourage everybody to check out the book Money and Liberty. Uh, check out uh, the more information of James. I think it's really important that we all understand it. I Thank you, James. I learned some stuff today. Uh, really appreciate that. That's why I, I always feel blessed doing doing this and interviewing some you know, smart people like yourself, because to be honest, I get to learn a lot of stuff as well as educate the audience. So thank you for today. Thank you, John. It's been great being with you. Yeah. And I will see you all again for another interview really soon. Thank you. I'd like to do that. Thank you.